Now, welcome back. Let's turn our attention to Mr. Colton Foster from the United States, who will present bilingual literacy practices and translanguaging strategies. Mr. Colton Foster is a bilingual educator, teacher trainer, and curricular development developer with expertise in bilingual literacy practices and translanguaging. Currently serving with the Costa Rica Ministry of Public Education, Colton is an English language fellow with the U.S. Embassy in Costa Rica with a background in primary education and experience in Mexico and Texas. Colton is now working to enhance bilingual education to promote effective language learning strategies with preschool educators in Costa Rica. Let us give the floor to Mr. Foster. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to get my presentation up. And I would like for us to start off our session today with something that I do with my classrooms. These affirmations actually come from like a 30 day yoga challenge that I did myself. So they were originally designed for adults. Um, I chose the best ones that I found were the simplest in terms of language and concept for young students. And these are ones that I share with preschool and primary teachers. Um, you could start out by teaching one uh, a week and then adding on as you go, depending on the language level of your students. Um, and I would like for us, if we can participate uh, in the chat, to read the options and choose one. You can just put the number. You don't have to type it out. Uh, which one would you like to use for yourself today during this presentation? I'm going to put number 12. It says, I am enough, soy suficiente because I'm here, I'm speaking in front of a large group of people and experts, but I know that it's okay, I'm enough, I have something to say. Three, nine, 11. So I feel calm and relaxed. Me siento tra tranquila y rebajada. Okay, nine. My peace is my power. You can also think about which ones you could apply to your classroom, which ones might be interesting uh, for students. And as an extension, you can ask your students to explain why they chose that affirmation for the day once they know a few of them. So that's just an activity to get us started. As um, they said, my name is Colton Foster. I'm an English language fellow with the US Embassy here in San Jose. And I'm currently posted to the Early Childhood Education Department for the Ministry of Public Education. Um, I have about 12 years of experience in ESL or English as an additional language or foreign language and bilingual education. I've taught in the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, as well as Texas, uh, Dallas and San Antonio and Houston for a short time and in Mexico in the city of Puebla and also in Mexico City for many years. Um, my bachelor's is in Romance Languages and Latin American Studies and my master's is in bilingual education. So our agenda for today is I want to start off by sharing a bit about my English language fellowship project. And I want to give the privilege um, of sharing 
the exchange opportunities and resources that the U.S. Department of State has available to English teachers. And I will then get into kind of the meat of the session, which is discussing bilingual literacy and translanguaging. And we're going to be looking at a resource from the U.S. Department of State's sponsored English teaching magazine, the English Language Forum from American English. And the title of that um, article is Using L1 in the L2 classroom. So we'll be looking at the resource and then I will be talking a bit about my own experiences. And at the end, of course, we'll have time for questions and discussions as the other sessions have. So for my English language fellowship, I am currently developing a self-paced six module massive open online course that is currently being piloted and will eventually be available for all preschool English teachers across the country. Um, I'm also facilitating monthly dialogue circles with the preschool English teachers here in Costa Rica. And we're looking at EFL teaching practices, and we're trying to foster the learning community that is already there and enrich it. And I've been doing a series of sessions on translanguaging. The next one will be translanguaging session three. <laughs> and I think that we're just going to have a four part session um, or a fourth part to the series. Um, I'm also conducting observations and participating in teacher trainings in different regions across the country. Uh, those trainings are related to learning accelerators such as ABC Mouse and My Math Academy, which um, those of you that teach in uh, primary and preschool are familiar possibly with those programs and their use in our classrooms here. Um, and I also talk about bilingualism and co-teaching in the EFL classroom. Uh, my favorite part about my fellowship are a lot of the outreach opportunities that I'm able to do and attending conferences such as the this one. Uh, in the photo, you can see that I had the honor of being a spelling bee judge at a high school, a technical high school here in San Jose last week. And that is a photo of me with the winner of the spelling bee. And those are really great opportunities for cultural exchange. Um, speaking of cultural exchange, um, I'm on a government sponsored exchange program through the Office of English Language Programs, um, and I am posted with the U.S. Embassy here in, in Costa Rica. But there are many um, exchange opportunities available for non-U.S. citizens. I'm on a program specifically designed for U.S. citizens. However, non-U.S. citizens can participate in programs such as the Fulbright Foreign Student Program, the Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistantship, um, also the Humphrey Fellowship and the TEA program are just four of the many programs that are available. And these programs offer graduate level study or opportunities to teach in the United States, leadership development programs of varying lengths, and they also provide scholarship for study in the United States. So I just want to give a nice plug for that. If you go to the website exchanges.state.gov, you are able to put in your home country, the country that you are a citizen of, and it will filter programs for teachers or researchers, et cetera. So please check that out. Um, I think these programs are uh, really transformational professionally and personally. Um, and if you're interested, please, please take advantage of these opportunities. Um, there are also a lot of resources provided for English as a foreign language teacher through the U.S. Department of State. One of uh, the resources are the American English Live webinar series, which happen throughout the year. There's currently one happening um, until July 26, and the theme is developing critical thinking skills and increasing practices, um, best practices, inclusive practices in the ELT classroom. Uh, and I'm going to go to the next slide. With the AmericanEnglish.state.gov website, you can access a lot of information about comics for language learning or resources, videos, text. There's a teacher's corner, and you have a lot of opportunities to look into things about how to teach aspects of US culture. And 
I went through and what I really like about the website is it takes these research articles, educational research articles that are, as we know, quite long in length and have long abstracts and tons of charts and tables. And they can be quite um, daunting for a classroom teacher to read through and analyze. So what they've done is take those condensed them, taken the key parts of the research, and then they have made the language accessible and designed for English as a second language teachers um, that are non-native speakers of the language. And I chose just a few of the titles that I found interesting, uh, such as Using Daily Routines for Language Practice, one that specifically stood out to me was the word salad. It was vocabulary reinforcement for kinesthetic and visual learners. Um, there's also a lot of different teachers who share their perspective from their teaching context. Here you can see there is a teacher that uploaded about her classroom in Paraguay. So you can get a more globalized context and see which things are different and which things are applicable to your context based off of someone who does the same job as you, but across the globe. So as we kind of settle into talking about translanguaging, I have some guiding questions. You don't have to put these in the chat. I just want you to kind of keep them in your head as we go through this session. Have you previously incorporated translanguaging in your teaching? If yes, how has it impacted your student learning and engagement? How can educators balance the use of multiple languages in the classroom while ensuring progress in the target language? In our case, English. So just keep these in your head as we go through. You'll see another statue thinking, and we'll have a few more opportunities to reflect. OK, I would like for you guys, as we start talking about languages, to kind of have some a moment to really appreciate languages and the diversity, the linguistic diversity that we have in our world. And I have an image here with some of the most commonly uh, spoken languages or well-known languages uh, that say welcome in different languages. And if you could, in the chat, please try and identify some of the languages that you see. Obviously, I'll start with English. <laughs> French, excellent. Thank you, Claire. Japanese, nice. Any others? Those are correct. Mandarin, yes, Chinese is there. Italian, Spanish. We're missing a few. Arabic with a question mark. Thanks for taking a risk, Anna. You are absolutely correct. Arabic is there in blue at the bottom left. German at the top and green, nice clear. What's the other green one? Russian, excellent. Good job, Rosa Maria. Did anyone get Benvendu? I think someone said Italian, and I'm I'm questioning if it's not Portuguese. <laughs> Russian. We have a guest for Thai. Let's check our answers. Let's see how we did. We have German. They kind of go in the same order-ish as the 
the picture. German, Hindi, Chinese, Spanish, English, French, Japanese, Russian, Arabic, and Portuguese. I think we did quite a good job. <laughs> Okay, so the article that I chose from the magazine by William Shears begins like this. Among a number of professionals in the field of second language acquisition, there appears to be an increasing conviction that the first language has a necessary and facilitating role in the second and foreign language classroom. In my case, this conviction comes from personal experience recent literature I have read, and presentations I have attended. This position may seem heretical in light of what most of us were taught when trained as ESL slash EFL professionals, but I believe it is worthy of serious consideration. He goes on to talk about how he does some action research and observes his co-teachers or the other teachers working at his school in Puerto Rico. And he says, I recorded the classes of four different teachers this semester, and my findings varied. Two of the professors never used Spanish to address their classes. One of them permitted students to answer questions in Spanish, and the other only used one Spanish word in the frame. How do you say fresa? in English. Here I have an example. How do you say ojo in English in that context? The third teacher never addressed her class in Spanish either, but she used Spanish very cleverly to illustrate points that she was making about English. For example, when teaching greetings, she asked the class how one person greets another in English. They said, hello. How are you? Then she asked them how they greet people in Spanish. They came up with lots of answers. Como va todo? Que cuentas? Pura vida? Buenas? The students came up with those long lists of possibilities. She then explained that it was the same in English and listed many possible greetings used in la that language. So not necessarily their equivalents, but other options to use, such as, hey there, what's up? Long time no see. Hey, you. The last teacher used the most Spanish in her teaching. Interestingly, she is the most mature and experienced of the four. While she is speaking in English, she throws in a sentence or phrase in Spanish. This seems to keep the students who do not understand her every word on track as to what is happening in the lesson. For example, we're going to listen to a speech, un discurso de una estudiante activista, and I want you to try and understand what she thinks about recycling. Okay, I want you guys to participate again. Thank you for being so participatory. Um, how do you use your students' native language in your EFL classes? Is it A, B, C, or D? A, you're similar to the first two teachers, not speaking to your students in Spanish or the language of your students, but letting them sometimes answer in L1, or you might say, how do you say this word in English? Are you more like B, the third teacher, where you don't address your students in L1, but you use L1 kind of cleverly to make certain points about English? Are you more like teacher C, where you mix some of the L1 and the L2 to clarify understanding for your students? Or are you D, you use the L1 in your class for a different reason or for different reasons? I'm curious. Okay, we have C, it's a mixture. C, a mixing. Both B and C to make clever points and for mixing. 
B, to make clever points. Excellent. B and C. 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 B and C. C. Thank you, Claire. B, it depends. I can't see your whole comment, Johanna, but it depends. Okay. Excellent. B, also C. Okay, I'm seeing lots of Bs and Cs, and then people that are saying, you know, it really depends on the context and the situation. I think that's really, really important for us to make that distinction that it could be a combination of all of these or D, many other ways to use the native language. And we're going to look at those today in this session. So in education, there has been that traditional practice of separating the languages in the classroom. They've tried to do it by subject. They've tried to do it by teacher. They've tried to do it by time allocation. However, there has been a recent change and a shift towards a more dynamic approach that encourages the use of multiple languages in the same lesson. So the term translanguaging comes from Wales. Um, I, I, I'm not perfect with the pronunciation of the original term in Welsh. However, it was originally translated as translinguifying, and then eventually kind of the, the, the researcher settled on the word translanguaging. And translanguaging is an approach to language teaching and learning, and it emphasizes the fluid use of languages, and it has a strong background in bilingual education. These two researchers that you can see here on the screen are the researchers that have really pushed um, translanguaging and made it more prominent on the world scale as far as a pedagogy. And this is Ophelia Garcia and Li Wei. Um, there is a, a part here at the right, which is another part that I pulled from the article that we're reading with the Puerto Rican teacher. It says, Starting with the L1 provides a sense of security and validates the learning, the learner's lived experiences, allowing them to express themselves. The learner is then willing to experiment and take risks with English. And getting the feedback from you guys that you're already aware that you're using the language, I think that you see the benefits of uh, some aspects of translanguaging pedagogy. And I just wanted to show you some of the examples that are probably already happening in your classroom just naturally. When students mix the two languages to communicate their ideas, they're translanguaging. When students whisper something to another student to make sure they understood what the teacher said um, so that they can complete the work that they're doing, that's translanguaging. Uh, when a student can't think of a word in English and substitutes the Chinese word or a classmate helps them come up with the word. I wanted to say this word and I say, no, it's that. I thought about it. I know that's translanguaging as well. Um, I put a timeline here uh, so we can kind of get a bit of a historical context for those of you who are not aware of kind of the language prestige uh, debate and language revitalization efforts that are happening and have been going on and have been quite successful, and very successful in, in Wales. Um, so they were already using this approach with Welsh students as they worked to increase academic skills in English and Welsh. Um, and that was going on around the 1980s in their bilingual education programs. And then the two researchers I showed you prior, they have a book. It was written in 1994 called Translanguaging, Language, Bilingualism, and Education. So while this concept is relatively new, it is not 
completely new. It has been going on, you know, since the 80s, and it's still taking time for this to really be incorporated into pedagogy. Um, the framework has expanded, like I said, uh, around the years 2004 to 2008, but I'd like for us to focus on the end of the timeline. From 2017 to 2020, it says there's translanguaging in the Global South and UNESCO. So the importance of translanguaging practices is acknowledged in the Global South where multilingualism is prevalent, emphasizing its role in promoting linguistic and cultural diversity. And UNESCO recognizes translanguaging as an effective pedagogy for multilingual education, and UNESCO encourages its, encourages its integration into policies and practices worldwide. So there is quite a bit of support and there is gaining support for this type of pedagogy so that we can, as teachers and educators can better implement it and learn about it and researchers can consider it um, when they are working in the field of e English as a foreign language. Um, in the article, what I found interesting is the author, the Puerto Rican teacher, he refers to this article um, from 1993, which suggests the following possible occasions that you might use L1 in the L2 classroom. So things about negotiating what the lesson is going to be about with your students. Um, classroom management activities or behavior management techniques. Um, setting the scene if you're going to have a conversation practice or a writing prompt, making sure that they really understand what the goal is of the lesson before they do that active learning in their L2. Um, discussion of cross-cultural issues, uh, error explanation. A lot of times we spend time giving feedback and we're giving feedback in L2 and the student is not only battling with what is it that I did wrong, but also, well, I'm, I'm struggling to understand what my teacher is even saying that I did wrong and I end up being confused. Sometimes there is an opportunity for that type of error correction and explanation or grammar, difficult grammar concepts or uh, hard spelling techniques where it's really more important that the student understands the rule than it is for them to have that conversation in English at that time. As well, assessment of comprehension at the end. If you have read a story, you've worked on the read aloud with the students, they've went over the text and partners, and now you're ready to really see how they comprehended that story, you might ask them to summarize it for you in L1. You're probably going to get a much more rich and a detailed explanation of what they understood in the story. And you as a teacher, it informs you about what were the things that they missed? What is it that they captured? And I may not know that if I only assess in English. And it's a balance, right? You are gonna be doing most of your assessing in English, but there are times with comprehension where you can use it to expand what your student is saying. I, I would like for you guys to again just think about how you could take advantage of using L1 in any of these following situations. So again, in the chat, um, I know that's our kind of our only way to interact. Um, if you could say an idea that you have, or if one of these appeals to you, you can type it into the chat, such as joking around with students. So I'm gonna put to make jokes and have fun with my students. I definitely incorporate Spanish into my class because my students laugh at a lot of my jokes and then I make jokes in English. Sometimes they don't necessarily laugh um, and I try to do that to build rapport. helping students feel more comfortable. Yes, lowering that effective filter or that barrier of fear that they have and they build up. I know that's very common here.
we're gonna joke around with students so they can feel comfortable and secure. Yeah, that safety in the classroom. Explaining difficult concepts, right, Anna? <laughs> Daniela also joking. One, four, six, seven, and nine to test, help students feel more comfortable, carry out small group work. <clears throat> Excellent. Introducing new material. Excellent, that comparing and contrasting of L1 and L2, if we don't do it for the kids, who's going to, right? Who's going to help them make those connections between the languages? Vocabulary, definitely Rosa Maria for letting us know previous knowledge. What is their vocabulary that they know in their first language and how can we expand that and bring it into L2? All of the above, excellent Susie. Great. We're going to advance on just for time. Thank you for all of you who shared to check for comprehension and explaining difficult to test. Yeah, Isaac, that's a really good part. Oftentimes we're testing in L1 always, and we really don't get a full understanding of what the student really knows. Checking for comprehension, Gloriella says. Okay, the author goes on and he says, in spite of my allowing a role for Spanish in my classroom, students spontaneously use English in class and while working on tasks. They frequently use English with me when they come up with questions or comments after class. I feel the relationship we have developed by using Spanish occasionally has made my students more eager than usual to tackle the challenges of learning English. I'm only going to highlight a couple of these. These are a couple of the comments that the teachers he observed made. In the bottom left, it says, in my writing courses, I use Spanish because it helps students write better reports. It also serves as an additional input to ensure that they achieve the main objective of the course, which is the production of higher quality written work in English. And that's exactly right. When you look into translanguaging pedagogy, it's varying input and output, input and output in a lesson cycle. I really liked the, the bigger comment here at the bottom right because of the context and everything is contextualized when we're doing English language teaching and here or in Puerto Rico, uh, he, the teacher says, I think students can identify better with a teacher who speaks to them in their own language thereby letting them know that you respect and value their native language. It's especially important in English class because of the political, social, and cultural implications of teaching a language that is imposed on them. In any case, he goes, he likes to joke around in the class, similar to your comments that you guys made. And he comes to conclusion. This is the, a summary of the conclusion of the article. He says, while there may be different opinions that we have about using L1 in the foreign language classroom, he argues that judicious and limited use of the L1 has pedagogical and effective benefits. And he does want to prioritize English as the primary means of communication. We know exposure to the target language is absolutely important, but recognizing the value of students L1 and incorporating it is more student-centered, right? We're really looking at that holistic uh, view of education like we talked about in the last session here at the conference. Um, the use of L1 can also help dispel any negative attitudes and kind of increase receptivity to learning the language. If you invite the native language in, it's not such of a barrier to them because they can, the students see themselves in the class and that their contributions, their language, their culture is valued and that they can make, uh, they can find similarities and differences with other cultures. Are these teachers in EFL or SESL environments or both, Anna asks. 
These are EFL teachers because they're in Puerto Rico. So they are teachers that are in a Spanish speaking territory, part of the United States. Uh, but however, the, the language would be Spanish and then they would be studying English as a foreign language. I have seen the more complex and outer from the reality. They tend to need translanguaging more. Thank you guys for participating. Uh, we're going to jump in a little bit to talk about the differences between serendipitous translanguaging and pedagogical translanguaging because there is this umbrella term of translanguaging, which refers to the teaching strategies that are used to learn languages based on the learner's entire linguistic repertoire. Um, and translanguaging can also just refer to those spontaneous multilingual practices that bilingual and multilingual individuals uh, use every day, but applying those in a pedagogical way. So in other words, pedagogical translanguaging refers to specific teaching strategies, planned and unplanned, and serendipitous translanguaging refers to the discursive practices. So the ways that speakers use language, it's a bit more speaker focused as opposed to language focused itself. So looking at translanguaging as a pedagogy, we know that it's going to provide opportunities for students to develop academic language practices, especially as you bridge from one language to the other, helping them make those connections and distinguish between them as well by comparing and contrasting. Uh, it can support students as they engage with more complicated and complex tasks, such as viewing videos in their native language as a pre-activity before creating a poster in English as a final product. So that way they can fully understand the concept or having some options in the native language to really make sure that the content is understood because we're often integrating content and language learning. And we know that it makes a space for students bilingual ways of thinking and knowing and doesn't put a limit on them or forcing them into operating as a monolingual when they are in fact not monolinguals or they're working to be bilingual or they're emergent. And uh, students' um, social and emotional needs are often supported when you put in translanguaging uh, into the classroom. And I've seen it in my own classroom, and I'll give you a few examples in just a moment. Uh, to touch on that serendipitous translanguaging, the spontaneous and unplanned use of languages, you can use the moments where students are translanguaging naturally and make that a teaching moment. Um, if you allow learners to naturally draw upon their linguistic resources to enhance their comprehension, um, you can help them develop language skills that are more contextualized, which is our goal, right? And that student-centered learning experience. Here I have two pictures from my former students. So I have uh, two third grade girls in the bottom left photo and two first grade boys in the photo on the right. And I would like for you to answer what translanguaging strategies can you see? And is it pedagogical or spontaneous? And just to give you a bit more context, if you can't see um, in the photo with the books, there is a book, it says a puppy, and there is there are two students. The other one has the same book and it is written in Korean. On the photo on the right, I have the days of the week in English in my handwriting. On the left, we have Spanish and on the right, Korean.
Okay, we're seeing some different opinions come in. <laughs> Thank you, Jose, spontaneous, but translating spontaneously. Johanna thinks it might be pedagogical. Sandra, I guess both of them. You're exactly right, Sandra. As we kind of really think about it, they may be pedagogical at first. Of course, as a teacher, I selected the book for the students, got the books from the library, planned a lesson around character traits and emotions. However, after I had read that book first, the two girls shared the reading. And what was really interesting is the Korean translation, because of the spacing of Korean writing is much shorter than English, they often added in more words in Korean in the translation to fit the illustrations appropriately. So the book in Korean has more words in it and more um, details than the the English version. And the girl that was reading the English version uh, with her and doesn't speak Korean was very interested in what those differences were. And at the whole time, uh, my Korean student, she was translating and explaining the concepts that were the additions in the Korean book. And I was like, what a beautiful you know, experience that I wouldn't have had. And their communication was, was quite interesting to, to hear them discuss that. So it does become spontaneous, their conversations in that way, even though I've planned it. On the right with the two boys, this was just something I did right at the beginning of class, actually as a time saver, because I still needed to get a few things set up for the lesson. And I wrote the, them quickly and I said, you guys put it in Spanish and Korean for me. And what is nice is it's also a comprehension check for me. It's a reading activity for my first grader. They're having to read, understand, put it into their native language. And I'm able to check it with Samuel writing in Spanish. I could quickly just see, yep, he understands the days of the week or he knows their equivalents at least. And I knew with Junho, I used my phone with the Google image translation to hold it up and see if he translated it correctly. And if there was an error in the translation, I could point to it and say, are you sure that one's correct? Or he'll be like, oh no, it's the handwriting, it's sloppy. And he'll erase it and he would like write it more clearly and then it would pick it up on the translation. So I was even giving him almost like feedback in his native language at the time. Um, and I, I just think that these types of things really provoke critical thinking and they're both pedagogical and spontaneous um, in a way. So I've used translanguaging a lot in my own classroom. I have used bilingual books, as you've seen. Wordless books are another amazing tool that you can use. If the book has no words, you can make up a story. You can have students take different pages to make up a story. They can write the story first in their L1 and then in L2 or it can be provided in L1 and they come up with their own version in L2 that's for the beginning or the middle or the end. There's a, quite a bit of things that you can do with them. Um, audiobooks and eBooks are another great resource such as um, Epic is a great website you can use. WordWall is another one that I use for vocabulary practice. Um, parent presentations are a great way to incorporate translanguaging into your classroom. I had um, two parent presentations last year when I was teaching, one from a Japanese parent who kind of shared um, origami with the class, and in, we also learned a few phrases in Japanese and words, and the students were very, very interested. Um, I also had a Mexican um, mother come in and share about Hanukkah and Hanukkah traditions that she does with her family. Um, and she incorporated different words from Hebrew into the lessons so that the students could learn a bit more about the context of Hanukkah. So there's just a lot of different ways that you can use translanguaging. I really enjoy using flashcards with my students, which is why I chose to put the picture of the flashcards. And you can make your own flashcards. You can have students make flashcards, which is really, really fun. Um, but I 
particularly liked these because they have the translations in many languages on the back. And my students really liked to check and see what it was or compare if it was correct or looking at the pronunciation of it. Um, and you can vary your input. I would often be putting the cards in Spanish and they would be giving me the English one back or um, if it was in Korean, I would flash the word to them and then they would have to say it back to me in English. And they found it really, really fun. Um, there are really endless opportunities for translanguaging. If you'd like to take a screenshot, I'm obviously not going to take the time to explain each of these, um, but there are some really great ideas here. Um, and Angie, can I share the names of the pages that I mentioned for building vocabulary? Yes. One is called Word Wall. That's a really great resource where you can do remixes of vocabulary practicing. There's like Open the Box or Conversation Wheel. Um, those are really great. And there's pre-made ones that you can download or edit. And another website I mentioned is a free online um, website epic that's available for free for students during the school hours where they can have access to a library with thousands of different books and audiobooks and educational videos um, so that's one that i would definitely check out those are the two that i mentioned um, just to wrap up the session so we have time for question and answers i just wanted to put a quick summary of what we talked about today so Translanguaging um, es el uso de diferentes idiomas juntos. Puede ser una herramienta poderosa para el, el aprendizaje, pero también puede sentirse incómodo al principio. Translanguaging a menudo requiere que el profesor sea un coaprendiz junto con sus alumnos. Translanguaging es cuando las personas que hablan más de un idioma Usen las características lingüísticas de dos o más idiomas para maximizar el potencial comunicativo. Translanguaging se trata de la comunicación, no del idioma en sí. Y es así donde el uso de todos nuestros recursos lingüísticos pueden ser muy valioso. I have some discussion questions here um, that you can consider, um, and I'm sure that you guys have even better <laughs> ones. Um, it's just how can you enhance, uh, how can translanguaging enhance the language learning and academic achievement of your students? Uh, what are the potential benefits and the challenges of implementing translanguaging? Um, how does translanguaging align with a student-centered and culturally responsive pedagogy? And what role does the teacher play in kind of creating a supportive environment for translanguaging? And I want to give a shout out to, I don't remember the guy's name that did the session on artificial intelligence and gave us the image creation of GenCraft. I used it to edit some of the photos in this presentation, and it was really, really cool. So I'm glad that I was able to take something that I learned in the seminar and actually use it in this presentation. So shout out to that session. It was awesome. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much. We will open now the floor for questions. I would like to start uh, by saying that sometimes this um, translanguaging approach is very useful to develop critical thinking. However, what do you think? Can we apply this translanguaging at lower levels with kids? What happens when a group of the students are have a very high proficiency level. Do you recommend, maybe it is not using the L1, but maybe another language that can complement the learning and enriching the classroom. What do you think? Okay, so your question is, can it be used with older students and should it be with their L1 or an additional language? Did I get that correct? 
Correct. Okay, so yes, it can definitely be used with L1. Um, my previous position was at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, so I worked in their foreign language department, and I used it with my college university students, some of whom were <laughs> <laughs> three times my age, um, like like we had like uh, quite a few uh, professors there, and they uh, often use this strategy as well. So what I would do is, for example, um, have them choose one of their favorite songs in Spanish and try to rewrite uh, the lyrics to fit the tune, which is quite a challenging thing to do because you can't rely on translation. You have to rely on the number of syllables that are in there. So that's quite a bit of a critical thinking um, strategy. Um, also, putting text by text. So if we're reading a text in English, having the text in the native language um, side by side and looking at the comparisons of word choice or syntax can be really important for um, older students. Um, so yeah, I don't think that there is any uh, dif different or there isn't a reason that you can't do it at different levels. However, how you apply the technique uh, depends on the age because of making sure that it's an age appropriate activity. But yes, we can all as adults and even as very proficient speakers of a second language, we're still constantly learning our second language. And so there are many ways that we can utilize our native language. Um, and then the transfer happens backwards. Um, so like when I'm learning um, in Spanish, I'm also enriching my native language with words like inundated, which is a very difficult word in English. But if you know the word for flood in Spanish, inundacion, it's a very easy word. So there's quite a few um, language transferring that is happening uh, between and among languages. So of course you can include other languages as well to make those comparisons. If you want to say, look how the preterite is constructed in Korean, that would be a, a great way to look at languages in general so that you can really understand what is unique to English, which is the target language that you're teaching. We have seen that incorporating this approach will reduce the effective filters. So students, we have a more a spontaneous participation. Uh, how can you motivate teachers to use the uh, native language? Because sometimes they are kind of reluctant to use that language in the classroom. Um, I would say that it really is more of like a paradigm shift and a professional development um, of administrators. So in many of the conversations that I have um, in the United States and um, in Mexico and here in Costa Rica as well, it's kind of like a recurring theme and it's a lot of um, kind of issues that have to do with like language, um, politics. And I think that a lot of administrators, when I say, you know, your, your teacher should be implementing translanguaging, they should be doing a small introduction in Spanish, and then doing their lesson predominantly in English, and then doing a wrap up in Spanish again to make sure that they understand what's going on. And a lot of teachers are like, oh, I'm not allowed to do that, or I do do that, but I don't tell anyone that I do that. So it's kind of this like, shame and this like, this load that I feel that teachers like are carrying with them, like, oh, I can't use my native language. And like that whole attitude really just kind of limits what we're able to do as far as research, development and improvement with translanguaging strategies. Even someone like me who's been using translanguaging strategies for the past 10 to 12 years every day in my classes, I still come up with new techniques and what worked best and wow and aha moments so i think really just try it out try introducing vocabulary in both languages and just doing that one week and see how it works try asking students to write a one sentence summary of how they felt during the lesson or try something as simple as showing a video of a a profound speaker, like we talked about TED Talks in one of our sessions here at the conference, putting a TED Talk in English, putting a TED Talk in Spanish, maybe first looking at what were the 
words that they chose to make that really impactful. And then looking at a topic in English that covers it, it can also be building background knowledge in the first video if it's tied to the same theme as the second one. So I would just say as a teacher and as a bilingual person, think about how you use language and how it varies throughout the day and what you use your languages for and try to implement that those same types of practices in your classroom because that's a more realistic um, reality <laughs> of what uh, bilingual practices are and we should be representing that in our classroom. You're mentioning teacher Angie is also saying that she she have to use she has used this in um, in Itali with English, Italian and in Spanish and it really motivates students. Very useful. Yeah, excellent. I think that uh, just le learning about languages in general is really important as a foreign language teacher. And you're usually not just have one L1 in the classroom. And you also have many students that don't have one L1. They're simultaneous bilinguals. They may be bilingual from birth. They may be heritage speakers. They may speak a native language. They may be um, have a, a Japanese parents or something like that, right? So there are a lot of linguistic diversity that we may not even be aware of if we don't do things like home language surveys or invite that language into the classroom um, because the child is afraid of using it. You know, I don't see many native students using the native language in, in the classrooms um, or that being invited in either. Um, similar in the United States, it's been um, many of my debates with teachers is inviting, you know, the Spanish language in because that's the majority of the second language learners that I had in Texas. However, yeah, it definitely works for multilingual classrooms as well. I've had classrooms where I've had uh, seven different languages, you know, in one class working at an international school. And I had to, you know, well, okay, how is it in uh, German? Please tell us. And how is it in Dutch? Great. Okay. And, but in port and then they get really excited, you know, no, but in Portuguese, it's almost like this. And so they can get, you know, uh, the, the conversations are elevated when you do that. We have two final questions. One from Sergio. How do you prevent students from relying constantly on L1. Do you explicitly mention the way it is to be used in class? Right, so those, I think that's really a student by student uh, based question. So I've had students that, um, don't rely on their L1 and they want to communicate with me still in English. I even have students that can get a little bit annoyed when I switch into Spanish, right? Because they're more advanced in English and they see that as me like helping as like a scaffold for those that aren't understanding. So I have to have the conversation on both ends of the spectrum. I have to explain to people that look at that as a challenge for you in that moment. I've also had monolingual English speakers and I've switched to Spanish like I did in my presentation and they stopped me, right? And I say, wait, take a second, use it as a learning opportunity for yourself to think, did I fully understand it in the second language or could I push it further? And for those students that are, um, I've noticed I had a student, uh, Michelle, and she would like never want to speak to me in English. And she was really nervous. And she, of course, knew that I spoke in Spanish. And um, there were times where I would be like, Michelle, you know, you really need to start trying with me more in English. You can do it. It's a motivation. And even having that conversation in Spanish with her open that up and, and she was in first grade you know she didn't have the ability yet and by the end of the year she was talking to me you know and she loved me and really wanted to learn more and she did progress as well as the other students in that classroom but it also took me partnering her often with higher students and things like that and being strategic about making sure that she got more exposure then some of the other students might have um, benefited more from an expansion, right? She was actually needing more exposure. That is definitely a very beautiful example. Congratulations. And we have this final quest. What is the impact of translanguaging? Um, I would just say it went from like when I first started working at um, the last school that I worked at, I uh, went into a classroom and it had a sign on the board that said no Spanish. 
Um, and then by the time I left that institution, we were going through translanguaging trainings, the entire staff. So even in that short amount of time, I worked at that school for five years, you can change the attitudes of institutions and staff with really not that much training, just getting an introduction and allowing it. And then you can build upon that. But I think that first step is taking away that ban, because when you put laws or bans or say no and, and, and complete no's, um, it doesn't open the chance for like, but what about this purpose and this purpose and this purpose? So I think that's something that we need to consider is just opening it up in the first place so we can all become better at about how we can do it effectively. Thank you very much, Mr. Confessor, for your insightful presentations, which will undoubtedly enrich the practice of all those in attendance. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm loving the uh, conference and congratulations to Ned. You guys have done such a great job. Thank you.